My name is Shaji Kumar. I am a uh, professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, where I take care of uh, patients with multiple myeloma and related disorders. Myeloma is a fascinating disease that we have for a long time considered to be a single disease, but as we understand more about the biology and how it responds to treatments, uh, it is becoming clear that myeloma is not just one disease, but rather made up of a group of disorders uh, with very different clinical behavior. Now, one of the challenges for the longest time has been uh, making the the correct diagnosis of a patient who actually needs treatment compared to somebody who has an early stage disease like a monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance or small ring myeloma who can go years and years without any uh, therapeutic intervention. In the spectrum of disorders um, that has monoclonal gammopathy at one end of the spectrum and active myeloma at the other end, uh, it is a gradual transition um, which obviously does not happen to every patient, uh, but for the patient who does um, evolve into active myeloma, we certainly have to intervene um, with uh, different therapies. Now, as treatments have become safer over the years and they have become more effective, even though we cannot completely uh, eradicate the uh, tumor, uh, we are able to control the disease for longer and longer periods of time and patients are surviving for longer periods. So um, it has been um, a great focus of, uh, for research in the field to identify patients uh, who are likely to get my, uh, active myeloma that needs therapy early on. So to this end, the diagnostic criteria of myeloma has evolved and particularly about four or five years ago, it was revised to incorporate uh, features other than the traditional CRAP features that we have used. So historically, uh, we have never intervened with treatment in myeloma unless patients actually developed end organ damage in the form of hypercalcemia, renal insufficiency, anemia, or bone disease, um, or they develop other end organ damage like what we see in amyloidosis uh, or um, significant uh, clinical features like what we see in some of the monoclonal gammopathies of clinical significance. But what has um, happened is uh, now as we understand the biology better, uh, we are now able to use some of the clinical and laboratory features to identify with more um, accuracy who is actually going to develop um, active myeloma. Uh, and once we can do that with reasonable accuracy, it uh, behooves us to uh, try and start treatment on some of those patients a little earlier than what he had done in the past. So three factors that we know um, predict a very high risk of progression to active myeloma uh, has been the bone marrow plasma cell percentage, the presence of imaging abnormalities other than lytic lesions, and very high uh, levels or really abnormal uh, free light chain ratios. Now, all these characteristics uh, likely uh, represent a quantitative or a qualitative evolution uh, in the tumor cell that predicts for um, transformation in the near future. So as a um, group, um, the myeloma of everyone in the myeloma field felt comfortable that if a patient has an 80% or higher chance of getting active disease, meaning a, one of the crap features uh, within the next couple of years, it makes sense to go ahead and get them started on treatment rather than wait for the other shoe to drop, so to speak. So uh, the diagnostic criteria for myeloma was revised uh, to include these three biomarkers in addition to the CRAP features to define or identify a person who needs active therapy. Now, this is clearly a work in progress. We know that there are still patients within that small ring multiple myeloma bucket uh, who are at very high risk of progression who are not identified by these three characteristics. And one of the disadvantages of using you know, um, a kind of a black and white approach using artificial cutoffs for all these variables is that we could easily miss somebody who may have um, multiple risk factors that are just below the threshold. So we have been, uh, as the, the International Myeloma Working Group, um, studying uh, the patients with small ring multiple myeloma to identify these risk factors so in a large 2000 patient retrospective study that was uh, recently completed, we were able to use these various risk factors in more of a continuous variable fashion so that we can develop a score that will identify a group of patients who have maybe a closer to 80% risk of progression in two years, which we think uh, could potentially qualify for 
uh, immediate in intervention in terms of therapy. This particular project also identified a group of patients who have a 50% risk of progression in two years, which we consider as high-risk myeloma, and is increasingly the focus of clinical trials. And in fact, a couple of phase three trials have already shown that uh, these patients actually have a better survival if you were to start treating them early. So that's clearly work that is in evolution. Now, what the um, what these diagnostic criteria don't always completely um, define is uh, to how you use that in the clinical context. So we cannot just do it in a um, recipe uh, uh, approach, um, go by exactly <clears throat> what is in the guidelines, but you have to be interpreted in the context of uh, the clinical picture. So if somebody has, let's say, uh, a free light chain ratio that's more than 100 and you've been watching that patient for five years and nothing has changed, then that patient may not be at a um, uh, you know, risk for developing crap features immediately. So the, the criteria may not necessarily apply in the exact same manner. Similarly, uh, in somebody with a high free light chain ratio, but who does not excrete much light chain in the urine, um, we cannot necessarily say this patient uh, has myeloma or is at uh, risk of developing myeloma in immediate, the immediate future. So there are some nuances to the diagnostic criteria, the way it is um, uh, developed, and it is meant to be a broad guideline to uh, help us identify the patients who really need treatment. Now, along those lines, um, the entire remaining patients with monoclonal gammopathies, while we realize that the vast majority do not need any therapeutic intervention, there are patients amongst those groups where there are end organ damage, right? So there are patients, these are the group of patients we refer to as the monoclonal gammopathies of clinical significance. So we know that there are patients who may develop neuropathy. There are patients who might develop um, clearly things like amyloidosis and light chain deposition disease have their own diagnosis and diagnostic criteria uh, to identify those patients who need treatment. But there are patients with monoclonal gammopathies who may not necessarily fit into any one diagnosis. And those includes people with some uh, renal disorders um, like inflammatory renal, um, inflammatory glomerulonephritis, um, which are often categorized as the monoclonal gammopathies of renal significance. Then there are neuropathies. There can be skin symptoms sometimes associated with this. So any um, symptom or sign that can be definitively attributed to the underlying monoclonal gammopathy may need treatment, even though they may not fit into one particular bucket in terms of a diagnostic criteria. <clears throat> 